Hello and welcome to the latest from Hearts Standard. My name is Joel Sked <clears throat> and I am once again joined by James Kearney. How's it going, James? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Uh, yeah, good to be day so far. How's your day going? Yeah, well, yeah, good, good. Um, we've um, sp spent uh, a wee bit of time writing up about the, the ticket situation uh, ahead of the Scottish Cup semi-final. That will potentially be the topic of a video tomorrow I do with Liam Corbett from This Is My Story, but we'll, we'll leave that there um, because we're not going to discuss the ticket situation at the moment. We are going to discuss Stephen Naismith because today marks the one-year anniversary of his appointment as interim boss taking over from Robbie Nielsen. So our plan is to look back on and reflect on the last 12 months that he has been in charge of. Thankfully, it was James who um, who brought the anniversary up because I hadn't realised it was 12 months on. But before we do that, of course, there is a message from our sponsors. And our sponsors are Wiesmann, renowned for their exceptional German engineering, is a leader in the boiler industry worldwide. They've now partnered with Scotland's own award-winning installation team, MPH Boilers, for a collaboration that is a match made in Scotland. When it comes to heating, Wiesmann boilers stand out with efficiency and reliability thanks to their advanced technology. And with the local expertise of MPH boilers, you're guaranteed top-tier installation and service. Together, they're offering an unbeatable deal a free internet controller with every Wiesman boiler, making it effortless to control your heating. Plus, they're throwing in the first year's service for free, ensuring your peace of mind. If you've been thinking about upgrading your boiler, there's never been a better opportunity. With Wiesman's world-class engineering and MPH boilers award-winning service, your home heating is in the best hands. Wiesman and MPH boilers, it is, of course, a match made in Scotland. Don't wait until it's too cold. Check them out today and step into a warmer, more efficient home. Now, James, since that is out of the way, where do we start? Let's let, let's go back to Stephen Naismith's interim spell in charge when he was again appointed April tenth, May eh, sorry, twenty twenty three, following Robbie Nielsen's departure after a really poor run of form. It was ahead of the derby with Hibs, the final pre-split fixture. Back then, uh, obviously, this uh, this wasn't on the this heart, heart stander wasn't on the horizon. So you uh, had no idea that in a few months' time you'd be covering hearts on on a full time basis, kind of using your knowledge from past and kind of looking back into what did what did you make of these interim spell? Uh, well, I suppose the first thing to say is that if, certainly from an outsider looking in. I looked very much as though Robbie Nielsen's race was run. You know, you could see why the decision was made to get rid of Nielsen and bring in a replacement. <clears throat> it kind of felt as if, um, yeah, things had just kind of fizzled out, I suppose. And it was, it, it seemed as though like a change of manager was probably what was needed. Um, when he got the job on the interim basis, I'd have to say I wasn't particularly surprised. Um, obviously, as a player, he's got considerable pedigree from his playing career, whether that was at Hearts, um, Norwich, Everton, Rangers. You know, he's played for some big clubs throughout his career, played at a really high level. Um, but then I think when you when you factor in the fact that you know Nathan has been working with the B team, he's worked with the under 18s, that he'd been working on Steve Clark's Scotland setup as well. These are all big ticks, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of when you're trying to, you know, appoint an interim or potentially full-time manager. I think he had, he had a good track record behind them. Uh, honestly, though, I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but when he got the job permanently, I was a little bit surprised, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Because I think, I'm... I, might, I might be wrong, but I, I think... His record was it was, it was in charge. Of, was it the last seven of the? It was last seven, seven games, games yeah. wasn't it? So there's one. Yeah. There's a Hibs game, and then I think there's a win over County. Yeah, that was a six-one. Oh, the count, was sorry, the count was it the um. So I've just counted seven games, and so there's five post-split games. I yeah. must have been. I must have missed out. I missed out a game because I, I, I called Hibs the last. Um, I think I think you missed out County. I think you missed out. Yeah, was County. it County? Was the yeah, yeah. It was the, the six one win, which is obviously you know tremendous, brilliant. But I mean, when you look at his record, you know those over those seven games, I think it's lost to 
one, two, drawn three, I believe. So I think um, you kind of look at it and you go, like, well, yeah, that's, you know, pretty fine, I suppose. Um, there's nothing too uh, alarming about it. But I'll be honest, I was a bit surprised when he got the job initially because I was kind of looking at that run of form and going, well, you know, it's not bad, but it's not hugely encouraging either, I would argue. But then you look at the subsequent you know, 12 months or so, and it's turned out to be a very astute appointment indeed. Yeah, so I, I was off the, I was off the same view when uh, the appointment was made. So when Robbie Nielsen was uh, basically was party company with the, the club, he had, yeah, he had someone, someone, one of many figures down the hearts, um, Past, present, and no doubt future. Who split? Up, uh, who splits opinion amongst amongst fans? It's just the the, the nature the nature of being involved uh, with the club. I agree that his race was pro, uh, was 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 run, and it didn't look like things were going to turn around. So something yeah. had to so something had to be done. I can that, that then having to do that? You're it's difficult to bring in a manager at that point of time and whether it's short term, long term. So I can understand why they went to went to Stephen Naismith. And then when he was appointed permanent in the in the summer, there was of course I think there was uh, I think there was kind of three categories of Hearts fans. One category who were happy for him to be appointed, one category who were kind of indifferent was I could understand it, but weren't like completely sold on it. Mm. And then there's another category where against it. I was probably in that middle category where uh, very much a case of yeah, hope, really hope he, he he does well and willing to willing to give him time as all managers should uh, should be able to get some get some time. But I was off the view that Hearts needed a more experienced manager to come in and take on take over from Nielsen and try and get Hearts to the, the, the next level. And mm. whether that just be closing the gap to the old farm, putting distance between Hearts and the rest of the um uh, the rest of the league and trying to get that third place consistent uh, consistently. And something Andrew McKinley mentioned when he talked about it that they wanted a kind of a manager with a proven track record. And that that was that was my view that it was probably if you're going to get rid of Nielsen, then you need to can replace them with someone who, um, who is, is a, a better manager or a more experienced manager, maybe a, a proven track record, as Andrew McKinley said. But then again, things change in football. And I know there's uh, Andrew McKinley, the, the, those words and those uh, those comments have been used against them. But like I said, things, the thing, uh, like just the, it, it changes and, Maybe I think the club didn't feel like there was the necessary options out there that they thought could come in and um, replace the Nielsen, could come from the outside, replace Nielsen and really take Hearts on to the next level. Those who perhaps did were costing a, a lot of money. So I can understand why they did go, having spoken to people behind the scenes, did go down the Naismith route because he is uh, very impressive. Resume, impressive, very impressive character. Yep. I think we've we've all seen uh, come to uh, come to realize that, accept that, understand that, and obviously his work with the academy, with the B team. Hearts want to get better at producing their own talent, and who better to have in place and someone who has been in charge of the B team, as understands the inner workings of the um, of the of the club behind the scenes, the academy, and also someone who's got a real passion for de- developing talent and wants to do that. So yeah. Uh, he, he ticked a lot of boxes. Now, I suppose for me, like I wasn't blown away by the interim games in charge. Mm. The, the Hibs game, his first game, hard to yeah. judge him on that because of the the turnaround. There was a whole Snodgrass uh, element of things where um, basically he was kind of moved on. Stephen Humphreys had to go back to Wigan because there was issues with uh, him essentially not being paid by the by the English club. So he had things to deal with. Hibs game was was terrible, but then there were moments where you saw. Promise that Ross County game, the uh, first half I think it was the first half against Celtic where Hearts did really well. And then Alex Cochran got sent off. There was the mm. draw at Ibrox where the team performed really well, and then the the character and mentality shown by the team to get a draw in the final game of the season against Hibs to secure fourth place. Hearts started really well. Alex Cochran got sent off again, and it was kind of back to the wall, back to the wall job. So I think that played into played into it as well that they saw. 
they saw a team who just had plenty of fight and character under under Naismith. Moving on to the summer, the big issue, just the mm. nature of the appointment. And from the outside looking in, it just didn't look good. And I always go back to the Sky Sports interview where it was Frankie McAvoy and Stephen Naismith standing, standing together. It just it was just uncomfortable. I think everyone, I think everyone was uh, in terms of that look was in the club was uncomfortable with it. But having spoken to numerous people behind the scenes, everyone kind of knew what was, what what the what the deal was. It's just the yeah. case that Naismith didn't have his uh, didn't have his coaching badges because he had just done his A license. Now you have to leave twelve months between that and getting on your pro license, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and just weird UEFA regulations. But perception is such a big thing in football. And the perception was was not good that uh, he went from interim boss to technical coach to uh, Frankie McAvoy being head coach. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was what what wasn't wasn't the greatest start, and I think that's what fed into what was essentially quite a, a, a poor start. Which then they're just that reverse momentum kind of uh, it went into kind of just started to build where things were just there was just a lot of negativity, a lot of criticism, and. You could understand the angst amongst the Hearts fans that the way things materialised over the summer. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, let's not pretend otherwise. As well, you know, results on the pitch weren't great at that time. No. Performances weren't great at the start of the season either, um, which obviously doesn't help matters. But yeah, I think the fact that you've got a, you know a young, pretty much untested coach at the helm. And then when you immediately kind of change his job role to, you know, technical director or whoever it was to make sure that, you know, you com- you're complying with UEFA regulations. Again, it's that thing where, yeah, I'm sure behind closed doors, you know, nobody paid it any mind. It didn't mean anything. It's just a labelling exercise. You know, the same way that, you know, you might sell the stadium rights, the naming rights to your stadium, but people are going to call it what they're going to call it anyway, so it doesn't yeah. really matter. You know, you're fine, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But... There were, I think the fact that he was an interim manager initially, the fact that he was untested, a young coach getting his first full time gig. When you've got that, and then all of a sudden the job title changes, and it's not clear where the demarcations or the delineations of power are. At that point, yeah, from the outside looking in, it doesn't look good. So you kind of go, "Well, is he ma- is is he the manager? Is he not? You know, how much faith are they really putting in him?" And I understand ultimately, it is a labelling exercise. It is a, it's a bit of sleight of hand really to keep you for happy let's be honest mm. and i get all that but again yeah from from the outside looking in it didn't look good uh, yeah like you say yeah it was a bad look but that's all it was you know i don't yeah. think there's anything that consequential from i don't think it actually changed anything behind the behind the scenes day to day or anything like that it's just basically just so they can keep you for happy. And if Frankie McAvoy ends up having to do a few interviews that he'd probably rather not do because, yeah. you, know, you know, he's a backroom coach, he's not the manager. Um, so he gets, but thankfully, you know, that did get, oh, I say thankfully, it's maybe not thankfully because like, obviously you'd rather see Hearts continue in Europe, you want to see them do well. So but, you're funny you say that, just looking at it, just uh, Glenn puts in the chat here on YouTube, was <clears> being knocked out of Europe a blessing in disguise for Naismith without it, he'd have been technical director until Christmas. There's definitely something in that. Uh, yeah, I mean that is that uh, it's obviously true. Like, yeah, he would he would have been. Would it have made a material difference? I'm not so sure. I think the mm. o- the only thing it would actually change is the perception of it from the outside, and that does have some bearing. I suppose it's kind of like soft power when you talk about kind of politics and stuff. It's kind of like yeah. soft power, and that yeah, you know, it's not in and of itself. It's not powerful, but I guess but, you know it does have an effect. But I don't know, like, you know, put it this way. So if, say if Naismith's job title was technical director from now until December, what do you think would have actually changed? Yeah. It's, it's a, it, like, again, if the team are playing badly and they're in bad form, it's another stick to beat hearts with. I get that. Fine. Yeah. People are going to do that. Of course they are. Fine. But say the rest of the results were the exact same, chucking a couple of your green games because obviously we're still in Europe at this point. Say they do fine. Does any, you know, nothing changes day to day in terms of you know the, the, the individual coaching behind the scenes, who's calling the shots on match day. The only difference is that you know midweek on a Thursday night, Frankie McAvoy gets wheeled out in front of the press rather than Stephen Naismith. 
that that's the only material difference. Yeah. But like we're saying, it's this kind of weird, soft, squishy area of where perception, like it kind of matters and it kind of doesn't. It's weird. <laughs> so there was there's the, the, I think the big one was the Rosenberg game. That was uh, that was yeah. that was like that was a highlight of that that kind of awkward spell. Obviously, started the season with a two 0 win at St Johnston. It was uh, and then there was some tricky, not tricky. There were some difficult performances or just difficult. Just say just poor performances yeah. in in the league at home and away. Like way to Dundee, where gave up cheap goals. Home to home to like Kilmarnock. Home to home to Motherwell where the team didn't perform well. Next, we've talked about the, the difficulty playing the Thursday to the, the weekend. Rosenberg, there was there was hope there. It was like that. That was that was a very harsh performance. That's what fans wanted to see was what they produced against them um, to come from behind, not just on aggregate, but on the night as well to uh, to stir and win. It was, a, it was a brilliant night at Tynecastle. And then I suppose the it kind of all led to... Kilmarnock away in the League Cup because that was a few days after the one they lost at St Mirren where the team again didn't perform well, gave up a sloppy goal. So there was there was already clear signs where the, the team were giving up cheap goals and there was a lot of possession but without any end product. Mm. And it led to Kilmarnock where there was a banner in the way end uh, aimed, at the, aimed at the board. And to be fair, there's Obviously, amongst the Hearts uh, support, there was a, a, an element of criticism and um, anger, uh, kind of criticism, and doubt towards Naismith, but it was never really, never really came to the fore during matches or on match day. The anger and angst seemed to be aimed at the the club board, but that even though that um, that was expressed that night, Hearts got a massive result and. Going to Rugby Park and winning and progressing the League Cup because they followed up with the, the the win at Ross County and it, there was just like it kind of showed signs that that there's um, that the team can produce and uh, have good performances, especially away from home. No, absolutely. You know, again, it's Rugby Park. It's Derek McInnes's Kilmarnock. It's not an easy game. It's about as hard as a game as you're going to get. And I, I'm, I'm sure I've said this before, but. In my mind, anyway, that's the turning point. That's where it, that is where it changed because you know, like you say, Harsh went to that game and Aesmith was under pressure. There was the banner unveiled before kickoff, and there were people starting to get um, cold feet, I suppose, or maybe people who were just going, "Joe, you know mm, not sure this this Aesmith thing is going to work out." Mm. And that was a really important win, I think. Uh, I think because of just because it was one of those games where Hearts can't really play; they want to play, but they got the result anyway. You know, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be a fight. And just the manner of the victory as well, with, you know, going one nil up, Kelly pull it back, and then they're kind of knocking on the door a bit, and then right to the death, hearts break forward to get the winner. And, yeah, and I think that was a turning point. Like you see, because like the next game, it was County away, they win one nil, good win. And then after that, there's back-to-back defeats to the old firm. The Obviously, the 4-1 loss to, Rain, uh, to Celtic at home, that's really poor. That's a game again, immediately raises all those doubts, all those questions come right back up to the surface again. And then after that, you get the game at Ibrox, where I mean, I remember we were you know, despondent, maybe putting it lightly. I mean, we, we were going there basically being like, oh, who knows what's going to happen here? And then obviously, Hearts came within a matter of minutes of getting a win, you know, it was a matter of you know seconds, arguably, or even a minute, I suppose, um, of getting a draw at least. So while that was a defeat, that was a disappointing performance, of course, it was. That was that ended up being a really pivotal game as well, though, because that was the game where the, the back three was first introduced. Yep. And okay, Hearts didn't win that day, but they came mightily close at a venue where they've had a terrible time over the last god knows many years. Forever. And then, and, and, and but then you know, from that moment on, that that you know, so I, I would argue Kelly's a turning point. And I, I'd argue, I know it sounds a bit daft because Rangers are a couple of games later, but I'd argue that's a turning point too because that's saw the back three come in. They saw a change in plan, a change in system. And it's one where Hearts, you know, reap the rewards for the next two months or so. I mean, I think after that game, I think the next 18 games in all competitions, it's 1-15, drawn two, lost one, I believe. The one, no, sorry, drawn, no, lost two. It's lost two, I think. Because saw the Rangers in the League Cup. And, Rangers in the League uh, Cup. And then... Yeah. Uh, so it'll be three. It'll be three because it'll be Rangers twice and then Aberdeen. 
Aberdeen, that was it. Yeah, Aberdeen yeah, and Rangers. Aberdeen. Rangers yeah, yeah. in Rangers. That was, there. that was crazy run where, I mean, I mean I've got a thing going at the site tomorrow, which goes into a bit more detail. But, you know, in the, in the course of that run, we see Hearts, they break the. So we, we'll, we'll come there. on. We'll, we'll come on to the yeah. We'll come on to the run. We'll come on to the run shortly because you talked about a couple of pivotal and uh, results and turning points. Uh, the yeah, the Kamara one. I definitely think that's that. That was kind of a big, a big result in early on in Naso's permanent tenure because by then he had been a, uh, the, the the coaching the the coaching change had yeah. been announced. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. It would been, have been. Had, yeah. Had, had been announced by then. Um, so that that had been announced by then, and then there was just that element. Of, but there was still that element of inconsistency. The Hibs one, the Hibs one stung. The dropping the dropping the two points at at Tynecastle, having probably been one of the probably the best domestic performance against a top flight club because obviously swept the floor with Park Castle. Did really well against Rosenberg, but in terms of a, a, a league match, it was probably the best performance against Hibs and. It was two 0 win. Was, was it eighty two seconds? Was it? Yes, yeah, so some something yeah. so so stupid. Team giving up really silly cheap goals, and even the, like the first one, yeah, um, wasn't great. But then just the manner of the second was was even worse. And then there's he obviously Nathan made a couple of a uh, couple of changes, and a lot of fans used uh, were very critical of that and just how the me- the momentum swung. But it was essentially eighty two seconds where. The, the team imploded, silly mistakes, and dropped two points. And then doing that at Hibs, doing that against Hibs at Tynecastle, losing from uh, sorry, um, not winning from being two 0 up, mm. that feeds into a really bad narrative around Naismith, and that only is going to annoy um, fans and for them to use as an example why he's why he shouldn't have been manager because there was at that time there was plenty of. The fans calling saying that it's not going to work out and the team uh, that the club should just um kind of s- stop there and r- replace them early on i would go forward a few weeks because then there was the rangers game uh hamden in the league cup semi-final it was just such a weird atmosphere we were both there and hearts got into half time at 0-0 but it just i don't know i just felt the sense from the crowd that they didn't really believe that Hearts were going to win, and it was just like a matter of time. They were kind of there as a chore, and then a matter of time for Rangers to get ahead and to what, win. What, what, what I would say on that though is, as well as I think the fans were right to feel that way in that instance, because like let's yeah. be honest, the team didn't really give them much to believe in that day. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then you go forward a few days, and I think the the win at Motherwell was massive. I think out of the you talked about the Kamarnik game, you talked about the Rangers game, the uh, the change to uh, a back three, spot on. But for me, the biggest the, the biggest result during that time was a win at Motherwell because that was a final game before going into an international break, and it was at that point where uh, it was at that point where a lot of games were being referred to as must wins for mm. for Stephen Naismith externally, not not quite internally because internally they still believed that Naismith was. Um, was on the right path and just give him time like they have and he'll turn around, which he has to a uh, uh, kind of fantastic effect. But you just look at managers under pressure. They see the international break as a potential opportunity to replace them. But also if your, t- your team goes into an international break off the back of a defeat to Motherwell, having performed so poorly in the League Cup semi-final, the noise just begins to build amongst the support and that criticism and... um anger at how everything's unfolded just grows and grows mm. but not only was a, a important win I thought it was a really really good performance it was yes 2-1 on paper but it was a performance that should have been much more hearts got denied a couple of really good penalty shouts like mm. Liam Boyce one I think came back and said that was it was a wrong decision but then you had Motherwell score and it put pressure on hearts the nerves tension rose but the team saw it out really, really well. Never at any point after Motherwell scored thought they were going to score again. I think they had one shot after that, and it was from long distance. So I thought that was that was a key game, and that, I think that was potentially the beginning of the. Uh, I think that might have been the beginning of our really. I'm just looking at my uh, notes here. Yeah, I think that was the the beginning of a really good run of form where I think we lost twice, twice in 18 or twice in 17 uh, 17 games. 
that was massive. And then you come back and, like you said, go on that run where you tick off so many milestones. No, absolutely. I mean, you look at it and, you know, within that run, you get Hearts eclipsing the away record from last season. Obviously, there's only three wins last season. They yeah. get up four. Didn't take long, but yeah, fantastic. They did that. There was, in that run as well, was the, there was the run when Hearts won, was it four in the bounds or five in the bounds? And that was the first time they'd done that in about five years. So I remember yeah. being astounded because I remember Naismith pointed that out and I remember yeah. just being like, that's crazy. You know, <laughs> you know just say, oh, Hearts, you know, you just expect that's a crazy record for a club like Hearts to have. So you've got those records in there. You've got the win over Celtic, the first since 2007, 6, 7? Yeah, 2007 in the league, yeah, yeah. 2007 in the league, 2008 in the league cup, I'm sure it is. That's what it is, aye, aye. So, you know, you've got all these kind of records falling by the wayside, which is all obviously incredibly encouraging. You know, these managed to, you know, not only match, but surpass what its predecessors have done. And it's all coming through in this cra- crazy run where Hearts are winning a lot, recording loads of clean sheets as well. I mean, this is one, something I've still got to look up for later on, but, I mean, when's the last time Hearts got this many clean sheets in a season? Like, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'd imagine it's been a good while anyway. Yeah. So I think, you know, you can see that there's... It's not only that the team are doing well in, the, in terms of the, you know, when you only look at it from just this season, but when you expand that out and look at the bigger picture, it's like, well, you know, they're doing better than... Most other Hearts teams actually, or a lot of our good Hearts teams have done. So I think that that was that was that run. I mean, obviously, I mean it's about half a season long, you know. So yeah, it, you know, the Hearts won almost every game. So yes, it's an important run. Yes, obviously, that's when you know maybe the doubters kind of changed their minds and got behind the team and all the rest of it. But I mean, it is a remarkable run of form. A remarkable run of form. You know. Um, it's, just, it's, it's been the foundation for the rest of the season. You know, yeah. it's, it's what gave Hearts that massive cushion between themselves and fourth. It's really set them up for the rest of the season. And you know, at that point as well, mind by the time we got to the end of that run, which is what maybe February or so, to talk at that point was, God, if Hearts have been playing like this all season, <laughs> yeah. like, who knows? You know, so I think it's important to remember how important, how good Hearts were during that run, and obviously they, it came to the end. Eventually, it came to the end, and. You know, rather emphatic fashion, I would suggest as well. Uh, we won't dwell too much on that, but I think the most important thing is that even since then, yes, there's been a little bit of a wobble. I think that's fair to say. But now, particularly with the win on Saturday, they appear to be getting back on track, just getting into the business end of the season. When I don't care what league table says, I don't care how many points Hearts are ahead. You know, this is yeah, it's the business end of the season, and this is when you come turn up to perform. This is when games matter more. And again, if Hearts really want to be show that they're serious and show that they really do plan on you know creating this gap between them and the rest, closing that gap between them and the old firm, then these games when you know nominally there's nothing riding on them, these are the ones where you can show actually no, no, because it is that mentality. Is that and yeah, that, yeah. I think that is a thing that Naismith has brought in the fact that you know again, again these next six games this season um, in league. They will be telling in that regard. We've seen previous Hearts teams at this stage of the season struggle, or you know maybe fall short when when it matters. This time, okay, that that same pressure is not on. They don't have the pressure of going, okay, you need to win in order to get results. But it will, it will, I think, be instructive to the mentality of the team in that if they can keep performing and rack up a good amount of points between now and the end of the season, when ultimately, let's be honest, they're basically nothing to play for. That that you know that's that kind of Celtic and Rangers level of mentality when you go into every game going no no we need to win this I mean, we need to win it doesn't matter who we're playing we we're, we're going to win and that's the difference between kind of the old firm and the rest obviously the money as well of course obviously the money <laughs> but you know like if you can kind of cultivate that mindset that attitude which some of the nation seems to be doing then I think that can only serve you well going forward. Yeah, that, that's I, I, with, that's one area you, you mentioned the money, but that's one area where you can make bridge that gap yeah without, exactly. without the money the mentality you look at the uh and then you can look at the kind of physical and um uh kind of the the, the, uh, the the physical side of things as well just before we touch on some of the stuff you mentioned there in terms of going forward we just wanted to talk about the the, the run and the, the importance of that run was you, you can you've seen it not just with hearts but 
clubs, just football around the world, where fans make up their mind about a manager. And you turn around and thinking, the only way the manager can get out of this is if he goes on a mental run. And that's what Hearts did. That's that was yeah. that was sort of the, that's sort of, that's the, really the, the main thing, the main crux of how a manager changes perception or changes the mood music around uh, around the support is by going on a massive run. And spoken to so many Hearts fans were just like, kind of put their hands up. It's like, I, I did, didn't see it coming, but fair play. And obviously absolutely delighted that that's been, that's been the case. The turnaround has been, uh, has been fantastic. I think the, the way for mostly we've now reached 10 went away wins, uh, uh, ended a 32 year old uh, hoodoo or hex or however you want to uh, want to, to call it. Yes, there has been an element of luck across this, this season. Hearts have won probably too many games by a single goal. There's even though there's been games where probably should have won by more, and that there's scope for improvement. And that's the big thing is it's still a work in progress. Hearts are not perfect under Naismith, there's still plenty to be plenty to be done. But the, there's a strong foundation there to to build on. The I, I do look at like the kind of organisation side of things so is really good. Still need to create better chances. I think that's that yeah. that's clear. But in terms of looking forward or just in general across these twelve months, how how has your view changed on Naysmith, or has it changed? Is it is is has evolved or developed? Yeah, no, I think so. I think it has because I mean, as I say, when I when when Naismith first got the job, and again, Hearts fans, you know, people won't like me saying it, but uh, my my honest take on it was that Aberdeen, the Hearts board looked at Aberdeen and went, "Barry Robson's done well there. Mm. We could do that." Uh, that is kind of what it looked like for the rest of us from the outside. I'll be honest. And again, I thought that you know, got was it two wins in his seven games in charge, something like that. You kind of go. Yeah, like fine. Like, nothing to check, check home about, really. Um, so no, I'll be honest. Like, based off the interim appointment, um, I don't know if I was convinced. To be honest, um, I don't think I was. To be fair, but I think that what I've seen in the subsequent, you know, nine ten months, whatever it's been, it um, it has changed my tune. It has changed my tune for a number of reasons. I think that. We've seen, you know, Naismith, you know, now, now that we're a year down the line, we've got a bit of an idea for, you know, how he wants his teams to play, the kind of things he does, what he's good at. And he it, it ticks a lot of boxes, I think, you know, in that something we harp on about a lot, and maybe it's just me because I'm a bit of a tactics geek, but like, you know, his in-game decisions, brilliant. You know, how many times have Hearts been losing a game this season, Naismith's made a change, and it's turned the game around. Like, you know, it's happened. Like, how many? I don't, I've not got the stats to hand as to how many points they get hearts again from losing positions. I would argue, I, I would guess, I mean, this is just total guess. I would guess it's the highest it's been in a good while. Yeah, I think we see it, we see it a lot. I think that we've seen him, we've seen this with, he's not shy about blooding youngsters or developing youngsters, giving them game time. He's not shy, he, he, he's not, he's not been struggling in terms of developing players. I mean, look at, for instance, the likes of Neuenhoff or you know Vargas when they first started to how they're getting on now, the couple like both of them have come a long way. So I think that you know when you look at those things, those are just kind of the traits of a good manager in my view, and someone that you'd want in charge of the club. Um, are there question marks? Of course there are. I mean, for a long time there was a question mark over Nice's record in the big games. By big games, I mean European games, games against the old firm, derbies. He didn't have a great record to begin with. That's now turning. That's gotten better. Obviously, they could still do better against Rangers, but you know, we'll leave that for another day. So I think, but I guess when you when you kind of zoom out and look at the overall big picture, you've got you know Hearts have reached semi final League Cup, beaten by Rangers. Semi final Scottish Cup. We'll see what happens. Third by a distance in the league, and doing it all while you know, like I say, promoting young players, developing others. And keep it a hold of guys like Shankland. I think when you kind of zoom out and I think look at the big picture like that, realistically, could Hearts have hoped for a much better season? Like, yeah, there could have been there could have been areas where it could be better. Don't get me wrong. Like, obviously, reaching the League Cup final would be good. You know, you know, beating Rangers would be nice. You know, making it into you know group stage of European football that could have been better. Of course, yeah, all these things could have been better. 
But on the whole, I mean, it's a pretty good season. Like, you know, that, there's not too many causes for complaints, I don't think, when you mm-hmm. look at it from that big picture and you step back and look at it all. I think the this is something that Joe Savage mentioned when I spoke to him early on in this this, this season and one, uh, one of the pieces that went up on the site was he understood the point where Hearts fans felt this shouldn't be a job for a manager who is learning and yeah. like his first job and he's, he's, the manager is going to be, make mistakes. He talked about, he gave the example of Guardiola at uh, Barcelona. He came in after uh, the B team and it's something that Naismith talked about as well, that he he also understood that uh, that view from Hearts fans that just it's their club. They, they want to see uh, the best manager in position as pos- possible. Yeah. So he accepted that he's, he was inexperienced, he's going to learn on the job. But to be fair to him, he has learned on the job. That he's, uh, I think he's, when he's when he's made a mistake, he's been, he's usually fixed it or he's, uh, or he's used it as uh, experience or inspiration not to do it again or do something differently the next time. We've seen, for example, like the the, the set up at St Mirren at the start of the season where Devlin is kind mm. of wide right, never been kind of never been seen before. Then also think when he first got the job, uh, so when he got in the interim job, he he said um, the fans want attacking football. They want a team that mm-hmm. goes into every game trying to win it. No one, not one that's going to defend and hold out for a draw or a one 0 lead. I was like that as a player. I wanted to be on the front foot and enjoyed having the ball and creating opportunities. I want to play entertaining football that's easy to say and harder to implement on the training pitch and in games but that's what i want so i think there was an expectation from fans that that was going to happen straight away that Mm. and again that was that was a stick used to beat beat them with the entertaining football has not really been there i think that's that's one of the next that's perhaps the next uh, next stage but what's better than entertaining football Win football. That's I think that's that's one that's uh, most important, and that's what he's he's done. I think he has found maybe a bit of pragmatism this uh, along the way, and just understanding the different environments, the different challenges that are set. For example, going to Kilmarnock and on the pitch, and what they um, what they do is fine. Let's just let's just play a bit more conservatively, or just not try and uh, kind of play through play through the thirds. So I think this team has learned to develop and play in different ways and I think that's came down from the manager who is who is flexible but that is that, that I think you kind of to, to finish up and look at what's next I think that's probably the next thing is to become probably a more entertaining side and yeah. live up to what he first said when he was interim boss and what that should be uh, what, what should be said is delivering that is not easy I think it's really easy to it's easier sorry to build a team that's defensively sound, that's organised, getting a team to play creatively, to create loads of chances, to play expansively, that's probably the, that's one of the harder things to do as a manager. And you hope that that's something that could be developed in the summer. Then with new players coming in, and then I think that plus the challenge of playing in the domestic uh, football and European football in one and not being... <sighs> In, in like six months, uh, four or five, six months times, whenever it is, not just hearing it's difficult because we're playing Thursday, Sunday and hearts are trailing the league. So it's trying to develop the, the kind of the style of the play, but also become a team that is used to dealing with the demands of what the fans want, but also the physical and mental demands of playing on a Thursday, get flying back from somewhere in Europe and then playing on the Sunday and having that expectation, living up to that demand and expectation to perform. And if you don't perform well, getting the result, because that is something we talked about, the mentality of getting closer to the old firm. That's something that the old firm have been better, uh, good at, is dealing with the demands of Europe and the demands of the domestic uh, football. It helps because they have more money. They've got a bigger squad. They've got more yeah. talent than players. But again, that's that's one of the next steps. No, definitely. And I think particularly on the um particularly when it comes to kind of you know creating chances, playing attacking football and things like that. That that's the hardest part to coach. Mm-hmm. That's the hardest part. You know, it's going to take the longest because it's more complex, it's more intricate, there's less time to get things right, and there's a greater margin for error. So it's always going to be the hardest part to get right. And when I think about Naismith's Hearts tenure so far. I'm tempted to have a look at you know Steve Clark's Scotland. To be honest, I think right. of 
you remember the first year or so yeah. under Steve Clark where there were a lot of very dour performances. There were a lot of games where there was not good to watch. But you know, it's the classic thing of you know, he started at the back, he got that sorted out, you know, made Scotland a bit better defensively, and then started working on you know the midfield and the attack. And I think that it's a similar sort of trajectory that we're seeing from Mesa the Hearts as well. Where I think, you mm. know, I think the defence has largely been sorted out in that, you know. If the Hearts play a back three, then more often than not, they get a clean sheet, you know, and I think you know, there are obviously different systems for different games, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I think that the defence has, okay, it's not perfect, it could be better, of course it could, but I think in terms of the entry, you know, that that's that kind of box ticked off and taken yeah. care of. So now you need to move on to the more kind of, like I said, the more sophisticated attacking patterns of play, the bits where the extra little details make all the difference where an extra half second makes all the difference and that bit does take time and it is harder to coach harder to teach harder to train harder to learn sorry but to just come with time you know yeah and sorry to jump in on there it should be noted and this is again we, we kind of talked about it on monday and this isn't just special to nasus but it still should be uh, uh something he should be praised or positive about he's done it without key players this season where he's been injuries yeah. where thankfully we talked about Shanklin thankfully he's been fit but if you look past his whole career he's very rarely injured but you look at Barry Mackay and Liam Boyce two of the more experienced guys who the, the club the, the team the squad manager could have relied on at times this season but would not been able to so being able to do that with having to get more out of younger players like Newenhoff, Vargas, um, Oda and then the development in Forest, for example and the development in like players like Cochrane. So he's brought players on and he's also had to do it without the mature players he, he's talked about in the final third as well. So I think that's that's another area where he, he should be praised. No, absolutely. Again, yeah, I think that he's got a, I think at this stage, okay, it's still maybe a bit too small a sample size because it's only one year, which in terms yep. of player development, not a very long time. So maybe yes, it's yeah. more, maybe being a little myopic, but yeah, no, I think that based on the evidence of what we've got, you know, you can see that there are players who are improving, who have improved over the course of the season. There's probably a few that, there's probably a couple that have regressed. That'll happen. There's probably a couple that haven't really kicked on at all. That'll happen too. But I think on the whole, it's quite promising, particularly for those younger players, particularly those who are kind of maybe early 20s, first team regulars, getting minutes, still getting used to the league. Because guys like Vargas and Neuenhoff, I think, are the most obvious examples where it maybe takes them a bit of time to adapt, maybe it takes them a little bit of time, but as time as time marches on, they're getting better and better and more and more consistent, more and more reliable, more and more effective. So, yeah, no, I, I think, and again, you look at somebody like Alan Forrest, who's a brilliant example of someone who, prior to the Smith's arrival, was considered a squad player. People weren't really too sure if he had a... You, you, know, you certainly wouldn't have said he was one of the first names on the team sheet, and now he is that, and now nobody bats an eye because they go, well, yeah, he's great. And mm. I think a lot of that's because of the, down to the coaching. And they, again, it's that thing, could he be better? Of course, the forest could be better. Yeah, there's bits of his game that need to be worked on still, and I'm sure that is getting worked on. But the more important thing is, is their development, and you constantly you know that's, to be fair, from, from just about day one with Nathan Smith, that's been a very constant thing from him, is that it's all about development, you know, it's, you know, it's all about the journey, not the destination. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, that, I know it's a kind of cliched, you know, birthday care nonsense to an extent. But at the same time, like that is true. You know, like that whole idea of like, constant improvement, constant development can always be better. Yes, the, yes, we did well, but there's always room for more. That's what that's what a heart manager should be, and that's what they should have, and that's what they should be constantly espousing. Otherwise, you know, you're never going to pull away from the rest. You're never going to catch the top two if you don't believe that. Mm. So again, I think that that again does that kind of. I think just when you hear, when you speak to Nathan Smith and you hear him in the press, I think it can be maybe a little bit dry at times, maybe a little bit understated. But I think the big thing you'd say about him is that he always seems quite sensible. You know, in terms of the way he comes across, the way he approaches things, he doesn't get carried away by big wins, doesn't get despondent after defeats. He's always quite, you know, quite a steady, level-headed guy, and I think a lot of times he says the right things as well. And saying the right things is great. It's great if you can say the right things. It's more about you do the right things. And I think for the most part, he has been doing the right things as well. So I think the last 12 months or so, I think it's fair to say it's probably gone better than a lot of fans expected. I don't think 
there have been too many that would have said when they've got appointed, ah, you know, this time next year, we third in the league, 11 points clear, both semis, you know, Shankland going for the golden boot, all the rest of it. You know, like, I don't think many would have said that. So I think that, again, when I'm, wherever I judge any manager, I always look at where were the team when they began, where are they now? Mm. And for me, I look at Hearts and I think they've taken you know, significant strides forward over the last 12 months. And I think because of that, you can see that, that Nate Smith is doing an excellent job. Yeah, I, th- I, don't, I think that's the, the best place best place to leave it. Excellent job. There was obviously, and I think he'll be the first to say, still more to come. And there's, I mean, yeah. it's always striving, striving for better. Agree with what he says in terms of the, uh, the media. I, I always enjoy listening to him. I think he's... Um, he, he is someone who doesn't get too high or uh, too down. He's very um, just uses his experience. He, he, he speaks so experienced at a high level that he knows what football's like. So um, it's, it's criticism and stuff that comes with football uh, because he got he's, he's got plenty of uh, plenty of criticism from uh, from pundits across certain areas and and us. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, and us and. Uh, it doesn't bother. He accepts it. He understands. He understands that. Uh, understands that side of football. So yeah, I think he's he's been really impressive, and he's he's obviously got clear ideas. And I think he's quite good with the, the players in terms of explaining those clear ideas, so they all know mm. where they stand. And I think that's a big thing for players is that they buy into managers who let them know where exactly they stand. Let, can, kind of brings transparency, which I think from um, conversations I had is very much the case at Hearts, but we will leave it there. Uh, I need to shoot off very, very soon. So uh, thank you very much, James. That was um, uh, that, that was um, it was, a, it was a good chat. I enjoyed enjoyed listening to, which is uh, hopefully the uh, people listening and uh, whether on YouTube or later in the podcast will to as uh, will do as well. For all the latest from Hearts, uh, head across to heartstandard.co.uk. We've got stuff up there on Barry McKay, stuff up there on the semi-final tickets. Of course, tomorrow we will have a piece from James looking back at the last 12 months of uh, Stephen uh, Naismith's reign. So do check out that tomorrow. And then I might be back tomorrow with Liam Corbett from Missing My Story to talk about this ticket situation. But if not, then I'll be back on Friday to discuss the Livingston game at the weekend in the Scottish Premiership. But until then, thank you very much, everyone, for listening, supporting, subscribing, engaging, and have a good evening and goodbye. Bye-bye.